Good morning. I know we're a few, but good morning. Good morning. All right. Good morning. Welcome to National City Christian Church, our live stream worship service. We're glad that you've joined us here today, and we hope that you will come every Sunday during these times via Facebook or YouTube. Welcome to our service today. Just a few announcements I want to make you aware of. First, if you are tuning in and you're a church member, you should have received information about our church congregational update uh, following this service at 1130. That was emailed out to you, so please join us at 1130 via Zoom for our congregational update. It will be great to see everybody together. Please remember that our church facilities still remain closed during this time. We are waiting for the mayor's orders about how she might begin to reopen the city. But until then, please be in prayer for our city leaders, for our regional leaders, and stay healthy. We wish you the best of health and safety in these times. We want to turn our attention to our prayer concerns today. There are a few. Please continue to uphold our pastor search committee. They've been hard at work and hopefully they will have an update later today. Our other prayer concerns for our church family are Doug and Chico Cook, Dorothy Davis, Eddie Franklin, Helen Gray, Constance Jennings, Jim King, Frederica and Tawana Lloyd, Lucas Lund, Alter, Alta Mayner, Drusilla, Drusilla McCain, Beverly Schott, Steve Seldy, Wes Strautman, Kathleen Swihart, Gloria Taylor, Esther Tyson, Peggy Washington, and John Foster Woods. And of course, during these very trying times, we want to continue to lift in prayer all of our medical and first responders who are working so tirelessly during these times. Again, welcome to National City. We're glad you are here today. Now let's begin our worship by singing our opening hymn, He Lives. Will you join us? as you worship with us. Long, long. 
life's narrow way He lives, He lives Salvation to impart You ask me how I know He lives He lives within my heart Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian Lift up your voice and sing Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives. Walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within. Let us pray. God of the journey, we give thanks for the twists and turns of life, for resting places to get perspective and be renewed, for detours that surprise and awaken, for companions to share the journey. In this resurrection season of new life, we give thanks for all that makes us whole. Thank you for loving our salvation into existence. Thank you for providing for us. Once again, we come with full praise, worship, and love for you, our one and only God. We thank you for all of our blessings, even the blessings for which we didn't even have to ask and may even take for granted. Creator God, help us to see your world in our lives with your eternal vision. Thank you for the beauty of the world, the freedom to believe, the fellowship of friends and a faith which brings us a renewed sense of healing and justice and peace. Thank you for the privilege to bear your great name. Thank you for the founding of this church. Thank you for the continuity of Christian witness. Thank you for this church and our leaders and teachers who devote their time and share their knowledge with us to help us to become the best Christians we can be. Touch and bless them and give them what they need so that they can ever work to increase your flock. On this morning, we take advantage of this precious privilege of prayer. We approach the throne of grace asking that you would work miracles in our lives. For each of us has different needs and we plead that you would move on our behalf in marvelous and life-giving ways. Give us the increase in our minds, and our bodies, our spirits. Lord, move in our families, on our jobs, in our homes. Move in our finances and provide jobs where they are needed. And just strengthen our fortitude and give us the strength to continue to run this race. We confess, most merciful God, that we have not always loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We, are true, we truly and humbly repent. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. We remember those who are suffering on this morning those who are sick and shut in, those who are about to give up hope, those without the basic necessities of life. We thank you, God, for being a healer and a restorer. And we thank you for using us to help. God of ages, we thank you for National City Christian Church and the whole body of Christ and the multitude of believers who comprise over 2,000 years of Christian witness on which we currently stand. We thank you for Christian friendship, the caring smiles and the love that we show each other, especially during this pandemic. For we are disciples of Jesus Christ. 
We are a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. We will not hesitate at the hint of adversity. We will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. We will not meander in the maze of mediocrity. We will not negotiate at the table of evil. We will not ponder at the pool of popularity. And when we see Jesus, he will have no trouble recognizing us for the banner over us is love. Keep us in your hands, O God, and shape our lives with your resurrection hope so that each step we take on earth beats a path straight to heaven where we can see you in all of your glory and we can see Jesus at your right hand and we can mingle with your heavenly angels in your kingdom throughout eternity. All these blessings we ask for, we thank you, all these blessings we ask you for and thank you for in the blessed name of Jesus, our beloved Savior. As the disciples were taught to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 13 through 35. And the scripture reads, Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish are you and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah would suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, say, saying, stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road. And how, he had been made no, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. Amen. Day of a rose. 
unknown companion walks with his own when they invite him as fates the first day and bread is broken Christ is made known when we are walking doubtful and dreading blinded by sadness slowness of heart yet Christ walks with us ever awaiting our invitation stay do not Lo, I am with you, Jesus has spoken. This is Christ's mess, this is Christ's sign. When the church gathers, when bread is broken, there Christ is with us in bread and Christ our companion, hope for the journey, bread of compassion, open our eyes, grant us your vision, set all hearts burning, that all creation with you may It's been six weeks today since we had to make the heart-wrenching decision to close the church facilities and begin to worship in a whole new land. These past days have seemed surreal, but also provided us a chance to feel the isolation and wanderings of our Hebrew forebearers in their wilderness and Babylonian exile. Worship of our God has been different. Worship that had felt so close and personal in this beautiful sanctuary is different. Our emotions are different. And certainly our hearts long desperately to be back in this place with one another and with God. Let's face it, <laughs> Facebook and Zoom just don't have the same effect as our famed architect, John Russell Pope, envisioned. But we have journeyed on, journeyed through six weeks of Lent, lamenting our own sin and commission and Jesus' crucifixion. But we still managed to walk to the tomb with Mary and the disciples to discover once again the tomb empty and hear the good news of Easter morning. We should be ecstatic, right? Our hearts should be on fire with the passion of the passion and resurrection story. This is the third Sunday of Easter, friends. For God's honest sake, be happy. I have a sneaky suspicion, though, that we are not alone in some of our feelings of melancholy, or even downright sadness. Our two friends on the road to Emmaus in our scripture passage sore, sore seemed sad. Luke even says as much. When Jesus incognito approaches and asks, what are they discussing so intently? Luke adds that editorial statement, they stood still, sad. Eugene Peterson, in the translation, The Message, states it this way. They just stood there, long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Wow. I can relate to that feeling. As worship leaders, I know I speak for the team 
When we say we feel like we've lost our best friend or friends, we miss the moments of greetings, of sharing hellos and hugs and handshakes. We miss the sounds of children and toddlers running through the hallways. We miss the sounds of choirs' voices singing to the rafters in this magnificent place. We miss you, our best friends. During the course of my study surrounding today's lectionary passage, I was struck by Luke's juxtaposition in the text of another journey, another road, so to speak, to travel, that is the setting of this story. But it's paired at that same moment with the closeness and proximity of the characters that lead to the climax of this part of the narrative. <laughs> Maybe I've just in the habit of reading too much into things, but it seemed like God was screaming out to me, my people need to hear this. In the midst of this entire world's journey we call coronavirus, we need to be reminded that our living Lord walks with us. We journey far, but God is near. We long for the fellowship of believers, but we pray to the saints who've gone before us. We lose hope, but our hearts, passions are ignited. But before I get too far into the story, let us sit for a moment in the difficulty of those two men leaving Jerusalem with no news of resurrection, no promise of the Messiah's great return, and no sense of purpose. Instead, when greeted on their way home by what they presumed to be a stranger, they explain with a sense of painful abandonment. We had hoped Jesus was the one to redeem our homeland, Israel. We had hoped. We had hoped. It's the phrase that leaves the minister often without words. I wish I could tell you the times I've heard that phrase when there's nothing I could do but hold a hand, give a hug, shed a tear, or say a prayer. These are humanity's experiences that bring us to what I call the crises of belief. When members or loved ones simply see no risen Christ, no church to seek, and certainly no God with answers. Phrases like, we had hoped the furlough wouldn't be permanent. We had hoped the doctors would be wrong. We had hoped this time we would have a child. We had hoped the cancer wouldn't return. We had hoped the marriage would, would get better. We had hoped this time he would stop using or drinking or cheating or abusing. We had hoped there would be more time. We had hoped. The inner Broadway comes out in me as you knew it would. When I hear this story reflected on by scholars and preachers opining about the disciples' slow reaction to recognize the resurrected Jesus, weren't they familiar with little orphan Annie's triumphant song, the sun will come out tomorrow, bet your bottom dollar on tomorrow, there'll be sun. Don't they know? Don't we believe that Jesus is the Son? Of course, it's easier for me, it's easier for us as armchair quarterbacks to wonder why Jesus' followers were so clueless, or as Jesus chides, oh foolish ones. But Luke then steers the listeners of his narrative to this transition point of the post-resurrection experience, 
only after, quote, the stranger has opened the scriptures and interpreted the prophecies of Jesus' death and resurrection, do the men begin to have a stirring in their hearts. Luke goes to great lengths at this point to stress that when they arrived at the village, Jesus keeps on going. <laughs> it's almost as you can hear the two men saying, wait, where are you going? Stay here with us. Indeed, they did not want this connection to end, nor do we. And then it happened. As they shared together, he took living bread. No, not just wheat and flour, but broke the bread before them and cleared the fog of death and confusion away. In recognizing Christ as a stranger at their table, God once again became real. God became honestly known to those who would still could or would believe. <clears throat> Sometimes it's only in reflection after moments of a life event or a life well lived do the experiences like the one Cleopas and his fellow sojourner shared on the road to Emmaus, move us to great action by the depth of the passion stirred in their hearts, stirred in our hearts. Such was the case for Russell H. Conwell, beloved lecturer, lawyer, and Baptist minister, and as a 21-year-old captain in the Civil War. According to Albert Hatcher Smith's The Life of Russell H. Conwell, he writes, One day Conwell was leading his company in sudden retreat across a burning bridge when he had found that he had left his sword behind. A young lad from Vermont dashed through the flames and came back with it, but a few days later died from his burns. Not long after, Russell Conwell himself lay wounded all night on the field of battle and faced there the best he had ever seen, a vision of a lad all aflame, sword in hand, legs, arms, and face blackened by the fire. A silent vow went up that night that if he would spared he would live his own life and that of the lad as well. After the war, Conwell became a newspaper correspondent, a lecturer, a lawyer, a this and a that. But his vision would not fade. It seemed to him that in this strange world, there was just one way to live two lives. And so he became a Baptist minister and built a great church and university in Philadelphia, now known as Temple University. Only at the foot of a cross at the church could he live his own life and the life of Johnny Ring, the lad who saved Conwell's life. Well stated, Mr. Albert Smith, well said. Sometimes our hearts on fire can change the world. It did for Cleopas. It was in their retelling of the sacred scriptures, the breaking of the bread and sharing a meal that these two disciples then recognized the risen Christ. Don't you see, friends? Don't you see? When we are faithful to the mission of his majestic church, it is then that we have a heart's passion to live heroically in the midst of this pandemic. It is because our hearts still burn with very little oil, frazzled though may we be, that we hold out hope. No, beyond that, we fan the flames, we stoke courage, we keep going, and we share with those longing to hear. It's the third Sunday of Easter, for God's sake. 
Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Fred Craddock, famed Disciples of Christ minister, known as one of the most effective preachers of the 20th century, said this about remembering an event or experience with a heart's passion. When writing about these two men, he writes, there are three times in which to know an event, in rehearsal, at the time of the event, and in remembrance. And in rehearsal, understanding is hindered by an inability that the event will really occur or that it will be so important. At the time of the event, understanding is hindered by the clutter and confusion of so much so fast. But in remembrance, the non-seriousness of rehearsal and the busyness of the event give way to recognition realization, and understanding. This is a time of understanding an important trip, a wedding, a gathering of friends, or a conversation with a stranger turned Christ at table. I am sure we can all relate to the wonder of Craddock's story. Yes, even the mystical incarnation of God in the remembrance of that special revealing event. It becomes, becomes legendary in our minds and certainly in our telling. There is an urgency, an inexplicable desire for everyone in earshot to know firsthand the thrilling moment through words and pictures. It is life transforming. It breathes expectant hope. It sings a new song. It writes the next chapter. It begins the new career. It inspires a nation. It even creates a new creation, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. While I was a student pastor in Eastern North Carolina, some of the best experiences of my three years with that wonderful congregation were the spring retreats to Caswell Beach, just south of Wilmington. Each year, I and about six adults would load 40 youth into rented vans and make the drive down Interstate 40 to the beach. I am not sure if you've ever had the privilege of driving 20 youth in a van for three or four hours down a road, but it can be a post-resurrection experience in itself. The last year that I was their minister was a special one. More than 15 of the youth who had been the core leadership team were graduating in a mere few weeks. The spring retreat was special that year and made even more so given that one of the newly baptized youth had devised the theme, Hearts on Fire, based on the Road to Emmaus text. He even designed the traditional retreat t-shirts that the youth would adorn on the weekend. On that Saturday afternoon, before the ever popular sandcastle competition around that year's theme, the 17-year-old youth shared with the group his interpretation of the text. During his remarks, he shared that he never knew one could actually talk with Jesus until he read that story. He then looked at his peers and said the moment he actually told Jesus what he hated about himself was the first moment he felt something stir in his heart. As he continued to share about the preceding months of growing in maturity, not only in his youth, but in his faith, he shared that feeling of warmth became like a fire, so that one Sunday he literally jumped to his feet before he even knew what was happening. That was the day Christopher became a Christian. And he knew exactly what those two disciples felt on the road to Emmaus. 
That dusk, we all gathered on the beach to award the best sand sculpture of the five teams, and Christopher would help the adults decide. I, I know the winner that day was a cross bursting from a heart that slowly transformed into a flame. But as I watched Christopher with a smile as wide as the shoreline, I realized I was the winner that day. For in one lad's transformative experience, I was brought face to face with the risen Christ and reminded of my own heart's desire and passion to share the gospel message through pastoral ministry. Family of faith, I am ever mindful that as Easter Tide's resurrection message brings exuberant hope and promises of new life as it did for Christopher, many of us are still on the road to Emmaus saying, we had hoped. The hard knocks of life and the deep wounds of betrayal and denial are still too raw and emotional for us. I understand. Your God understands. For those who must still traver traverse the road of we had hoped, take heart. Trust Jesus to share the journey and let your heart be warmed again. Who knows? Maybe by the time we get to August, it will not only be your body that feels ablaze, it will be your heart ignited by the flames of the Holy Spirit. Until then, I will wait with you. Know that Jesus will wait with you. Amen. We come now to a time in our service where we make commitments, where we make a commitment in our faith, we make a commitment to follow Jesus, and today I'm asking us to make a commitment with our tithes and offerings. It's difficult time these times, but I'm asking you that whether you mail your check into our church address or whether you simply click on that button that was on your email that'll take you to Tithely, these are gifts that are so important to the family of faith to keep our church going in these times, to keep handing out bags of food, and to keep reaching people in the name of Christ. Please remember your church, but more importantly, remember God is faithful to us. May we be faithful to God. Amen. As we begin our celebration of communion, we ask that everyone watching would participate with us by gathering the elements in your home, bread or crackers, juice or wine, and join us in this most important part of our worship service. 
Like those who walk with Jesus on the way to Emmaus, may Jesus make himself known to us in the breaking of bread and in the sharing of the cup. As we come to the communion table during this Easter season, may we recognize and affirm the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives and come asking God to renew the fire in us to share our faith in the resurrected Lord, to help others grow in grace, and to be used as ministers to the glory of God. We pray that the risen Christ would abide with us, that blessed by his presence, we may walk with him all the days of our life. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, blessed it, and broke it. And said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. In like manner, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Let us eat and drink together. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for renewing our faith, strengthening our hope, and kindling our love. Through the power of the living Christ at work in us, grant that we shall walk in newness of life. Amen. Please join us in singing the hymn of going forth. Sing of one who walks beside us.
Thank you for joining with us today as we hopefully have improved our worship experience. Thanks to some advice and counsel by many in the church and through Anthony McGew, our chair of the diaconate, we hope the new camera and sound has been very, very meaningful to you. Thank you also to our building superintendent, Morris Jackson, who's helped us with all of this. We thank you because it takes all of us doing this together. Hope you will be mindful of the congregational update following this service at 11.30 via Zoom. And we ask and pray that you continue to remember this wonderful body of faith, National City Christian Church. Now, as you go, my dear friends, go with the countenance of God upon your life. Go resting secure in his holy, holy name. Go through the power of the Holy Spirit to inspire and encourage and proclaim the Easter message, Christ has risen. Amen. Thank you.